Everyone, good to see you. Um, uh, today's story uh, uh, is, is a, perhaps an encouragement in that um, if you think you have troubles in your church, uh, they will rather pale in comparison to what happens in, in Munster in the 1530s. Uh, I think it's probably the most uh, extreme example of a dysfunctional uh, church. But before we get started, um, uh, Elizabeth is away, it's the high holidays, as, as you know, and uh, Nazanin is going to make an announcement about the sections for this week. That's, those are the people who are in, normally in Elizabeth, yeah. because she's not here tomorrow. Okay, great. Our, our, what we're thinking about today is the radicalization of the Reformation that happens almost immediately talked about uh, on Monday that already in 1521, Luther goes back to Wittenberg and finds that the people are smashing uh, statues and altars and, and saying, this is what you told us to do, to purify the house of, of God. And he said, no, that's not, that's not what, what I mean. By 1525, we switch to the Swiss city of Zurich, uh, where uh, radicalism takes another form, which you've been reading for this uh, week. Uh, it, it emerges from the circle around uh, the reformer Huldrych Zwingli, many of them his friends, Conrad Grebel, whose letter you read uh, uh, for this week. Um, and they go down a path of largely uh, shaped by pacifism, of separation from the rest of the community, a community of believers who, are, who enter into that by believer's baptism, the rejection of infant baptism, and the refusal to swear an oath to the state, and the refusal to take up arms. So that Swiss tradition of Anabaptism is largely pacifist and separatist. But that's one model that emerges. The letter that Conrad Grebel writes to Thomas Munzer that you have for this week, Thomas Munzer, who dies, as I mentioned on Monday, in the Peasants' War of 1525, he advocated a much more violent form of radicalism. And that was uh, that the ungodly should be cut down that it was the role of the elect to destroy the ungodly, the unbelievers. And that's important for our story today. So there are multiple trajectories, multiple traditions of radicalism. Another form which we encounter today is much more individualistic, the, the Swiss Anabaptists emphasis on community. And here in Munster that we're going to talk about, there's an emphasis on community. But there are also uh, what we might include in the tent of radicals, individuals who are highly mystical. They're often referred to as spiritualists, who emphasize a kind of separation from the church because of their emphasis on individual revelation. So this is a, and, and that tradition, uh, continues very strongly. It will highly influence later developments like pietism within Lutheranism, with this strong spiritualist and many other figures uh, running through to the 20th century, an emphasis on interiority of, the reli of religion, of mystical experience. So just to get a kind of broad idea, we're taught when we use the term radicalism, which of course is not always very helpful because radicalism suggests that something isn't radical. And that 
uh, you know, we're in danger, I'm certainly in danger of talking this, of suggesting that Luther and Zwingli and others are the absolute norm and that these are the deviants. That was the traditional view in sort of older histories of the Reformation. You would have the story of Luther, Zwingli, Calvin. This was the story of the Reformation. And the, the radicals or Anabaptists would be placed in one chapter all lumped together. And, and I've kind of done that in this course. Um, but what I really want to suggest, simply because of, of time and, and um, sort of to fit this into a course, but I'm, I don't want to suggest that these people are simply radicals who are considered outside the mainstream. Their views come very much out of the heart of the Reformation. They, they argue for justification by Christ. They argue only two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, as based on scripture. They share, for the most part, um, Zwingli's idea of what the Lord's Supper is, a memorial of Christ's death a close association with the Passover meal. So there's, there's a huge amount of overlap here, as well as difference. And, and the other thing I really want to suggest is, the, in many ways, these are equally reforming voices. Their influence, as we know, is enormous right through to our day. Not just like in groups like Mennonites and, and Hutterites, but their whole argument of of the relationship between church and state has been deeply influential. We have traditions where believer's baptism is very strong and central. So these are not just a fringe who appear for a time and go away. Their influence, in many ways, we could see is almost stronger than we might say of, of Luther today. So I've just put here uh, a sense that, and, and one thing I haven't really talked about, but it's important for uh, the story today, is also there is a strong apocalypticism to many of them, an expectation. But now this is something they share with Luther. As I said last week, Luther believed he stood in the last days, not the beginning of something, but the last days, the full, exp the full battle between Satan and Christ had been revealed the mask had moved and, and the face of Antichrist was revealed in the papacy. These, according to the biblical narrative, of course, in Book of Revelation, this showed that this was the last battle. It's a highly apocalyptic time, and that helps us to understand what happens. Uh, there seems to be a problem with it freezing. I don't know why. There is, there is this, in, this, all of this is taking place against a shared background that what's happening with the Reformation is not the beginning of a new world so much as the end of the world. The word of God has reappeared. This is sort of uh, telling us that Christ will return in the last judgment. So we just need to keep this sense of urgency uh, in mind as to what's happening. One of the problems of looking at any historical uh, event from a great distance, like we're doing today, is we tend to think the story is inevitable. That what happened next was, because we learn the story, we learn the narrative, we know what happens next. One of the things that I think the story of Munster tells us is nobody knew what was going to happen next. Nobody knew where this was going. The Reformation does not have some scripted text. Nobody knew. Everybody, a lot of people thought when Luther appeared before the emperor in 1521 at Worms, most people thought he was going to be executed. So I'm not suggesting it's random, but you have this constant interaction of forces of which doctrine is one, but only one, which is this intense situation where multiple outcomes are always possible. So we know what did happen, but these people had no idea what was going to happen next, except, as I say, a strong 
uh, sense of uh, that they lived in the end times. I've just put here uh, a few of, you know, just thinking about the legacy of radicalism uh, or that these various traditions that appear early in the Reformation. Here's just a few of the things we can think about from which this comes. A strong, mystical, spiritualist, apocalyptic tradition in the church. This is very much formative of Puritans in the 16th and 17th century. Of course, coming to America, this sense of apocalyptic. The Puritans, in many ways, are the inheritors of this radical tradition. The question, it opens up issues of what we might loosely call free thinking. Many of these people did not feel bound to traditional teachings of the church. And I put here a couple of examples. You have in this period the rise of anti-Trinitarianism, which for the most part was hardly existing in the medieval world. But now you get groups who profess to be Christians but would certainly not adhere to the doctrine of the Trinity. Why? Of course, the same in argument with infant baptism. It's not in the Bible. At least that's, I mean, others will say it is, but they would say it's not, depending on how you read it. Uh, so Unitarianism, uh, see this more when we start to talk about Calvin and Calvinism, is that we start to see in, I have to stress, the most embryonic form discussions of what we would start to recognize as religious toleration. Because one of the things the Reformation does in so fracturing uh, the, the religious world is that, it, is that people don't move. This is not a highly mobile society. People stay most of their lives where they were born. Of course, you have merchants and you have, you have clergy and you have university students who do move, but they are an incredibly small minority of, of, of society. Most people are born, live, and die in one place. Which means that often when religious change happens, like a, a, a prince or a city adopts Protestantism or Catholicism, the people just are forced to change. They don't get a choice in this. They have no voice in this. Suddenly, your prince has declared that your state is Lutheran or it's reformed. So there's no, they have little agency. And this is what happens in, in the 16th century. People often just simply change confessions. And, and that's a kind of an interesting question even for today. You know, what sort of choices do people make in the face of religious change? Many will choose simply to stay where they are. Others, of course, will move. Well, this is sort of what's happening here. But in this society, people did not have that sort of freedom. And this is, this is important for a point that I I'll come back to when we talk about Calvinism, because society is changing radically. Suddenly, you have within a community let's say just within a smallish city, a smallish city at this time would be about 5,000 people. A, a huge city in this period would be 100,000 people. Uh, so you have a small city of 5,000 people, and you have all these different forms of, of Protestantism. You may have a Catholic presence in the city, and what's happening for the first time is you might be Lutheran and your neighbor is Catholic. Or the people down the street belong to an Anabaptist group. What do you do? Nobody has faced this problem before. I mean, we think about it as denominations, and we're very, you just have to walk down a street, any American street, and you see a, a variety of different kinds of churches. This is the origin of the idea that you have multiple churches. Mo I, I hesitate to use the term denomination because that has such a modern sense to it, but you have different religious confessions mix. The baker might be one thing, might be a Calvinist. Uh, the, the person who makes cloth might be a Lutheran. The person who is engaging in trade might have Anabaptist sympathies. Yet they have to live within the same community. They have to trade 
with each other. They have to keep daily life going. But in a new reality, a new reality where people may have completely different religious identities. And so this, in many ways, is one of the legacies of, of radicalism, is that it continues, it, it, it contributes significantly to the diversification of religion in this period. Sorry, I don't know why it's, it's sticking. Actually, I do know why. Um, so I don't, I don't want to, I want to move on to the story of, of Munster so that we can get this. Um, but just to convey a couple of things. The, the worry about what are called Anabaptists, which in the 16th century is a broad term that we might take in as including almost all people who were regarded as radical, because one of the things that, that holds together most of them is the belief in adult or believer's baptism. But this very early on, as you can see here, by the end of the 1520s, is legally declared uh, illegal. You can, it is illegal for you to belong to one of these groups. And so persecution becomes very early on a central part of the Reformation story. Both Protestants, meaning like Lutherans and Zwinglians, or who will become reformed in time, and, and uh, are engaging alongside Catholics in persecuting those whom they regard as subversive or who have left the community. And persecution, when we, I talk at the end about Menno Simons, becomes very, we talked about Martyr's Mirror before, the persecution becomes an identifying aspect uh, like for early Christians, for those radical groups. They see themselves as persecuted minorities and that that gives them their identity as Christians in the world. What's happening here is that I, I get kicked off Yale Secure and a sign comes up telling me to join Yale Guest and that's what's blocking the... Um. So we talked about this. I, I want to to move on to the Anabaptist kingdom. Where does this, this story hap happen? Well, first of all, it's the most traumatic story of perhaps of even of the 16th century. It scars everybody. Even someone like Calvin, who we'll talk about, who's not even a Protestant yet. He's still a Catholic at the time the story happens. All of these people are traumatized by what happens between 1531, but especially in 1534, 1535, in, a, in the, city, the German city of Munster. So what happened? Well, it's a story that's made up of, of many parts, but I'm going to try and sort of uh, go through it. And I've tried to put as much of the narrative into the PowerPoint so that you can go back and, and look. Uh, there's also a very good uh, podcast about it, um, which so I'll send that link out. If any, it's about a 40-minute po podcast if you'd like to listen uh, to the story. So what about this city of Munster? I'll just jump forward here just to give a sense of where it is because this is important to the story. It's up sort of closer to northern Germany, but what's really crucial is that it's very close to the Netherlands. And it's in the Netherlands that radical religion has really spread and taken root for a variety of reasons, not least of which it's a center of commerce and trade. So there's a lot of movement. It's also, uh, um, of, you know, as it is still today, an important series of ports on the, city, uh, on the sea so that there is a great deal of, of, of uh, trade coming in by ship, but also up the Rhine River you see here, it leads up into the Netherlands, so connecting it with down into the, into the southern part. So it's at, a, it's at the crossroads of a trade center. It's also a very important Catholic city, which is ruled over by a prince bishop. This, um, this may, term may be unfamiliar to you, but many bishop figures, usually aristocrats, uh, or, or many of these figures were both bishops and princes, so both secular and sacred rulers. So I've, I've, I've said th this uh, here, I've, you got a sense of where it lies. 
The story begins with somebody who we might best describe as one of these individual spiritualists, Melchior Hoffman. Like many of these radicals, he comes out of the Reformation circles. He's, he's converted to uh, what he would say to the gospel, to core Reformation ideas. He isn't, uh, unlike many of them, he's not a cleric. He's actually involved in the fur trade. He's also involved in printing. So he's a, a person who has many different uh, trades. But he travels widely. He goes up into the Baltic, sort of up towards uh, Scandinavia, Sweden, and uh, Finland in the north, and the Baltic states of Latvia, and Lithuania, and Estonia. He's traveling through there as part of his, his work in the fur trade which means that he's highly itinerant and he's taking, and he's all, because he's also involved in printing, he's distributing religious literature. He's a kind of, uh, and this trade is often the way by which religious books are disseminated in this period. Uh, uh, merchants are a crucial part of the Reformation story. They're the ones who actually transport the books, the pamphlets, the woodcuts, and their religious sympathies are a crucial part of the story. So Melchior Hoffman is, is an example. He converts, as I say here, first to Lutheran theology, but then he moves towards Zwinglian and the Zwinglian idea of the sacraments. This is also reminding us that you know, we're not talking about fixed religious divisions here. We use terms like Lutheran or Zwinglian or Calvinism or Reformed, but these borders are extremely porous. There are, most people hold what we might call a kind of syncretic view. They have many different views drawn from different, this is just like in churches today. We rarely have somebody you would describe as kind of purely um, doctrinally this or that. Most of us, hold a variety of different views hold, uh, coming from different, different places. That's very much human, human nature. Well, this is certainly true of the Reformation. Most people are reading these books and seeing these pamphlets and seeing these printed things. They're hearing sermons. Uh, and so they're getting a whole range of different ideas thrown at them. And their, and their own religious uh, beliefs are probably a mixture of them. This is true of Melchior Hoffman. He has Lutheran ideas, he has ideas from Zwingli, and he's also someone who is highly spiritualist in nature. He has dreams. He then has, he accepts uh, the radical idea of adult baptism. So he is, he is baptized. He's also, as I say here, involved in iconoclasm, the removal of images from churches, the notion of the clan. So he's, he's holding all these different views together. But his ideas, he writes a number of pamphlets which become deeply influential. He's thrown into prison in the city of Strasbourg and, and becomes something of a kind of martyr figure for many. His writings of this person who is suffering in prison, he is very influential. And important to our story is that he's very influential in uh, the Netherlands, as I talked about uh, before, that, that the Netherlands becomes a sort of hotbed of radical ideas. Hoffman is uh, very influential. He travels through Dutch lands. We know that he was responsible for the baptism of many adults. So he's really propagating the faith. But this visionary aspect that I spoke about is evident uh, clearly in his view that the city of Strasbourg, where he was living, he has this vision that it will become the new Jerusalem. And he has a, a very specific expectation. He thinks in the, 15, the, war, in the year 1533, it will become the new Jerusalem. So the end will be revealed as, as in the book of Revelation. Christ would return in that year. Hoffman is himself not part of the violence. He is himself a pacifist. 
but his ideas about baptism, faith, community, church, sacraments, and spiritual vision of the return of Christ and the New Jerusalem, it deeply influential. And so the first person in our Munster story is a man named Bernard Rotman. Bernard Rotman, highly intelligent, very articulate figure. He's a Lutheran pastor. He is converted to the Reformation. He's ordained a Lutheran pastor. He goes to the city of Munster, which is still Catholic, and becomes part of a movement in the early 1530s where the city of Munster adopts the Reformation and a new Lutheran order is established. So this is the first stage of this. There is a Reformation in the city, and the city becomes Lutheran. The prince bishop that I spoke about before leaves the city, as do many Catholics. So we just have to imagine, the opening scene of this story is of a city that has become uh, uh, Protestant, and that Bernard Rotman is the leading figure. He is a charismatic preacher with a large following. But something happens. Rotman becomes very influenced by the writings of Melchior Hoffman, the spiritualist, radical uh, uh, views of Hoffman. And they, he also met Hoffman when Hoffman was traveling. And he's converted to the idea of adult baptism, believer's baptism. So this puts him in a difficult position. He's a Lutheran pastor. But he now adheres to adult baptism, not infant baptism. He, he, but he still has a strong following. And his views on baptism, but also on the Eucharist, you can see here he's called Bread Bernard because he adopts the Zwinglian view of the sacrament that the bread remains the bread. It is part of, in the Lord's Supper, an act of remembrance not in any way a physical presence. So he, he, he advocates this. He gets the name Bread Bernhard from Lutherans because this was an insult because of his, his, he had taken up Zwinglian views. But he's also advocating believer's baptism. Further, he adopts from Melchior Hoffman what we talked about uh, yesterday but needs to be mentioned here this emphasis on the basis of the Bible, the radical equality of all people, of all believers, which of course has its roots in Luther's teaching on the priesthood of all believers, but Luther, in the end, up upholds the hierarchical structures of society. These groups take that in a very different direction, and they take the priesthood of all believers and the teaching of scripture to mean the radical equality of all. And I spoke about on Monday that in many of the, amongst the Swiss brethren, there were prominent female preachers. Women were preaching and taking a leading role. So Rotman takes another step following uh, uh, Hoffman, is that he advocates from the pulpit a radical equality. Yeah, this is the problem with the yield secure. So I, I've sort of talked about this, so I'm just going to, to move on. So there's a great deal of instability in the city of Munster. You've got a Lutheran preacher who has now advocating from the leading pulpit of the city radical ideas which is not just religiously radical, but socially radical. The elimination of all hierarchical, social hierarchical structures. Things take a far more radical turn with the arrival of a man named Jan Matis. He is one of the people who is amongst this large community of radicals in the Netherlands, modern day Holland. He's been converted to and a baptism, he is himself rebaptized. In fact, he's baptized by 
Hoffman himself, when, remember, spoke about how when Hoffman went to the Netherlands, he, ba he baptized many of the people. Uh, one of them is a man named Jan Matis. But Jan Matis departed from Hoffman's ideas, Hoffman's pacifism. Jan Matis believed more in the direction of Thomas Munzer, who I mentioned earlier, that reform, radical reform, required a degree of violence. Surely isn't that what the, apocal the apocalyptic tradition said, that it would come with a sword, there would be a battle at the end, the godly and the ungodly would be separated. When he comes into the city of Munster, he argues for the destruction of churches, the breaking down of civil government, rule by all the people, radical iconoclasm, the stripping of all religious sites. This is part of this view, as I said, Thomas Munzer uh, advocated that the world has to be purged. Godliness is inherently a purging of the world. It's just a picture of Jan Matis. Uh, and I think this picture captures something of his character. You see the Bible in front of him on the table. Uh, this is a later picture after he died. But the spear in the other hand, this connection between violence and the gospel. Now, this is not new. Huldrych Zwingli, who we've talked about quite a bit, dies in 1531 <coughs> in a military battle. He, too, held to a notion that force was required as part of God's reformation. So this idea of violence and religion is, is certainly there. And in this sense, Jan Matis is part of that. The breakdown, the, the exile of the prince bishop, the, admin, the uh, creation of a Lutheran council, which is then destabilized by this radical preaching in the city, means that the city of Munster is uh, going into a state of chaos. Jan Matis becomes the leader in the city. He has many followers. One of the reasons he has many followers is that it, with this idea that Munster now would become the new Jerusalem, not Strasbourg, but the city of Munster, would imminently become the new Jerusalem. Hundreds and hundreds of people come out of the Netherlands into Munster. They want to be in the new Jerusalem. Rotman is preaching this, Jan Matis is spreading this idea, and Matis emerges as the leader of this. There is a strong Hebrew Bible vision here. So you have the creation of a new order with 12 elders. And they refer to it as the new Zion. So you can see what's being constructed here. This whole, I mean, this is, you know, medieval, early modern Europe is a very conservative place socially and politically. Luther advocated very clearly the idea that hierarchy and political institutions are part of God's creation. They're not just human cre uh, uh, fabrications. They adhere, social and political hierarchies are built into the order of creation. Some are called to rule. Others are called to be merchants. Others are called to be peasants. So this is, and this is why he resists the peasants' war. He says, no, you are resisting God's order. It's not about me. It's a, this, but the, and of course, you know, you can think of Romans 13. They can find evidence in the Bible that that religious reform is not about political and social reform or structural reform, hierarchical reform. This is why these radicals are so, are seen as so extreme. They have taken this connection, which happened in the Peasants' War of 1525, they've taken this message to a new vision of what society should look like. And for the most part, they're saying, and at this stage, it's going to change radically in a moment, you're going to see, but at this stage, they see it as a kind of egalitarianism. <coughs> 
which was also an idea we saw amongst the Swiss brethren, but of course they were entirely pacifist and would have been horrified by what they see here. The truly uh, e extraordinary story begins when another Dutchman arrives in the city of Munster. At the end of 1533, we see the appearance of the person who is most famously associated with what happens in Munster, Jan van Leiden. He's in his mid-twenties. He's a young guy. And he comes to the city of Munster, drawn to this apocalyptic vision that this city is imminently to be the new Jerusalem. He goes back to the Netherlands and preaches that this is what's going to happen in Munster. And more and more people come out of the Netherlands and travel to Munster. So the city is becoming overcrowded. It's filling with these people. And many of them are poor people. Because part of Rotman's message, part of Matisse's message, and certainly initially part of Jan van Leiden's message is that the poor are the elect. And that was part of their destruction of hierarchy. The poor are God's elect. So that's a, a foundation of, of this. Uh, Jan van Leiden, like all others, reject infant baptism, that the community is to be a community of the elect, of the purified, of the enlightened, of those who make a full profession of faith and then are baptized. image of Jan van Leiden, as I say, he's, uh, uh, you don't get the sense of it here from this picture necessarily, but he's a very young person. You know, this is a person who's 24, 25 who's doing this. But what you see here, is, as you're going to, we're going to encounter it in a few moments, is that you see he's adopted the office of political authority, but more than that, he has doesn't have a crown, but he has an orb, with, which is the ball with a cross on it, and he has the scepter. And you can see in his hand here, slightly difficult to see, but he's holding a Bible. He's holding here a rolled scroll, which is a clear identification with the, the Hebrew prophets. Jan van Leiden is going to declare himself God's chosen ruler of the city of Munster. I've, I've talked about this, so I want to move on with the story. So Jan van, Leiden, van Leiden appears in Munster in the fall of 1534 and declares himself a king the person who is going to augur in the new Jerusalem. At this point, the prince bishop, who was thrown out at the Reformation, raises an army and lays siege to the city of Munster. But what's remarkable about this is that the army that he has that surrounds the city of Munster and wants, seeks to take it back and restore Catholic authority is actually an alliance of Catholic and Protestant military forces. So that both, this is the f one of the few times in which Catholics and Protestants actually cooperate in the 16th century. And they do so because they see a common enemy in these radicals and increasingly radical uh, community in Munster. This is during 1534 into 1535. And what's happening in the city? We can see this. I've just listed some of the things here. Religious houses are torn down. Uh, church towers are torn down because there is this idea that there are not churches. There are not sacred places. The whole community is, is sacred, is the New Jerusalem. You have this egalitarianism expressed by having communal meals in the city, in the squares of the city. Private property is abolished. 
and libraries are burnt. This is an extraordinary loss of medieval written culture with the destruction of the library because that's seen as a polluted past that has to be cleansed. The siege of the city goes on for 18 months. And as it goes on, the situation in Munster becomes more and more desperate. People are starving. Uh, they, uh, many of them start to try and escape the siege. And the government under Jan van Leiden is becoming increasingly radical. It's not making any concessions to this. It's becoming increasingly uh, uh, radical. So I just put some of the points here. Strict communalism. Uh, the church, despite the fact that Munster was the New Jerusalem, there was a strict separation between those who were regarded as believers and those who were not. And those who were not might be people who still had Lutheran sympathies or Catholic sympathies. So it becomes a strong emphasis on the elect. But at the same time, it's also preparing an army to defend itself against this. Perhaps one of the most remarkable aspects of this, because remember there is a Hebrew Bible model for this community, it, it, perhaps one of the most scandalous things that uh, Munster is associated with is polygamy. Jan van Leiden himself is thought to have had 16 wives. But what's interesting is this, is that with many of people trying to escape, in Munster there are many, many more women than men. And polygamy, at least in part, was justified by the acts of the patriarchs with whom Jan van Leiden and the council, the council of 12, um, rule. Uh, so the patriarchs are thought to have given permission to polygamy. This is an idea that's not just um, um, here in Munster. The idea of polygamy is actually quite interesting in the in, the, uh, in this period, there are not a few people who think that if you hold to scripture alone, there is a model in the Hebrew Bible for polygamy. As I say, there's a strong uh, uh, misogynist streak in this. So one of the reasons for polygamy is that you, it's seen as bringing large numbers of women under control in the household. So, Leiden, Van Leiden declares himself a king, and he says he, it is the restoration of David. He's doing this in an increasingly desperate situation where people are starving because of the blockade. But it, he becomes this sort of delusional figure who is infamous for his spontaneous and often random conduct. He's, he's thought to have executed one of his wives with whom he was suddenly displeased. There's a story of him cutting the head off of a soldier who he thought was insulting him. Uh, he's having these visions. He sees himself uh, while people are starving. He accumulates much of the wealth and creates a very sumptuous court around himself. It's, he's a despotic yet still charismatic ruler who is destroying this community because of an absolute sense of self. I just note here that in, in, the, in the 1930s with the rise of Hitler, one of the common images that was made of Hitler was that he was like Jan van Leiden. So that, the name Jan van Leiden has an enduring image of the kind of maniacal ruler who's determined to take down, the, if, the, if the city is to be stormed and taken, he will take it down with him. Uh, so he's known as, as, as King Jan. Um, to, mo to move the story on, the siege increasingly takes hold of the city. Many people are trying to escape from the city because of the desperate circumstances. Finally, in 1535, so in, the, uh, in June of 1535, it's thought that some people collaborated with the uh, 
those who were laying siege and opened the city gates to, uh, uh, to the uh, besiegers. And suddenly the, tro the troops, remember they're Catholic and Protestants, pour into the city and there is the most awful slaughter. It's just beyond description. Jan uh, Rotman, remember this person going back to this, the stage who had been the preacher in the city and become increasingly radical, it takes up the sword and is killed in battle. Jan van Leiden, the, per, the one who had declared himself king of the Anabaptist kingdom of, of Munster, is taken prisoner. He and other leaders are tried tortured, and ultimately, in a very public way, executed. This picture doesn't show up too well here. You, if you look at the PowerPoint, I've got a close-up here. But this is, this is uh, uh, the, the cathedral church in Munster. So in the public square, you have the execution of these leaders in Munster, most prominently Jan van Leiden. Yeah, there we go. And here's a close-up from that picture. This is uh, Van Leiden himself, as you can see, tied to the stake. Here you can see the pincers are being heated. And there, they're using them to uh, sear his body. So it's, it's an excruciating death, where he is in public, tortured, he is dis slowly dismembered before being uh, burnt. Execution in the medieval and early modern world was a very public event because it was seen as a kind of drama in which authorities established over the people their sense of justice. So it's, it's executions rarely happen in, in private. And they, they take place in the most public places to demonstrate the hierarchical authority. So the prince bishop comes back into the city. The Catholics retake the city. Catholicism is restored. And in a ritual act, these rebels are killed. And Jan van Leiden... Uh, above all, is, is made a grotesque example. If you, you may know of these, but one of the things to, to enhance this public nature of execution is that the bodies of Van Leiden and others were put in cages, and the cages were raised on the cathedral tower. So here you can see the cages in which their bodies were placed. They stayed there for a very, hundreds of years, or what was left of them, until at some point, I'm not sure when, I think, in, I think in the 17th century, what was left of the bodies was removed. But the cages remain, and they're still there today. As now, they're taken as a reminder of the extremity of religious violence in the city's past. They are now um, symbols of of a kind of repudiation of that sort of, of religious violence. But they're still there, uh, these cages. This is actually a relatively recent photograph so that you can see that they're there. So what happens from the city of, of Munster? This absolutely sort of nuclear event where this extraordinary slaughter, the stories of polygamy, the stories of... of this, was see, this was seen as confirmation that radicalism had taken over. This is the dangers of the extreme version of the, extreme, the dangers of radicalism. And I'm going to end on this point. I want to talk about Menno Simon, so I'm going to move him to, to next week. Um, because he's an important part of this, the last part of the story, of how uh, the radical tradition goes in a much more pacifist direction. Menno Simons, 
uh, gathers up many of the refugees from Munster and will take that tradition in a very different direction. So I want to talk about that. I'm going to move him to, to next week. I want to end here with this idea that the catastrophe at Munster convinced both Catholic and Protestant leaders that they had to keep religion under control. That unfettered religion was deeply, deeply dangerous and subversive. So that the Reformation world amongst both Catholics and Protestants is going to change as it becomes ever more an act of the state to make the church part of the state, but a part of the state that is absolutely controlled. But it, all of this is based on a terrible fear of the chaos that can be unleashed when you have uh, the, the kind of radicalism in, that took shape in Munster. The radical tradition does not come to an end, but it will, but this is an essential turning point. I'll leave it there, thanks. <laughs>